Good evening, everybody. Glad you could join us again on our Sunday evening service. Um, this is our study in the book of Romans, and uh, we're so glad that you've joined us this evening. And uh, before we get into the message tonight, let's um, sing a couple of congregational songs. And uh, the first one we're going to sing is the solid rock. Let me ask you this question tonight. Is Christ your foundation tonight? I hope he is. Uh, it better not be your good works or any religion. It's got to be Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation that you can lay that the Lord will count other than Jesus Christ. So I hope and pray tonight if you're not saved, you'll come to know Jesus Christ. Christians, I hope you're building on that foundation. I hope you're building not wood, hay, and stubble, but gold, silver, and precious stones. I pray that what you're doing with your life in this time that we're living in, in these days, that you are building uh, uh, upon that foundation, something that will last beyond this life. It'll last into eternity, amen? So let's get to the song tonight, and uh, we will sing uh, The Solid Rock. song we're going to sing is, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? You know, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to deny ourselves, <clears throat> take up our cross, and follow Jesus Christ. And the cross implies suffering. There is a, uh, it is a hard sometimes for us as believers to understand, as even I spoke about this morning, identification with suffering. You know, as believers, we think, oh, now that I'm saved, maybe I'm not going to endure any kind of troubles or suffering. But even as in the book of Job, the Bible says that man is born unto trouble. As a matter of fact, it even says in the same book, full of trouble. So we all face trouble in life. But the Lord wants us to be a living sacrifice unto him, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And live for Christ, live for him, Amen whatever the cost, whatever the price, amen? So let's think about our Savior, Jesus Christ, being on the cross there. And let's sing this song, good old 
him must Jesus bear the cross alone. I was thinking about that one phrase in there about the golden crowns. And for those who know Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible talks about those crowns in different places. Of course, those are rewards um, for those who are saved and know Christ but live that godly life. The Bible lists about five, but we, there's probably more crowns that will be received at that judgment seat of Christ. And uh, But the Bible tells us when that event takes place, and in verse chapter 4, verse 10 of Revelation, four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne of the worsh and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So the Bible says, listen, I don't know about you, but I want to have some crowns. I hope and pray the Lord finds me faithful and I'll have some crowns that I can cast at Jesus' feet. Amen. I don't want to go through this life not receiving any reward. I want some gold, silver, and precious stones to abide at the judgment seat of Christ. And I want to be able to have something to give to my Savior. Amen. And you know what? Why would you cast them at Jesus? Because you know what? He is the one who deserves all the honor and glory tonight for anything we ever accomplished in this life as believers, amen? It's all about him. He worked in us and through us. To God be the glory, amen? Amen. Well, listen, let's get to our study tonight. We're gonna to look at Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16. We're gonna pick it up. Uh, we're gonna do verse uh, from verse 16, and we're gonna go all the way down uh, towards the end of the chapter there to uh, uh, verse, uh, verse 6, sorry, verse 6 to 16. Uh, we'll read a little bit into verse 5, mention one name in there. But uh, so anyway, let me read the passage to you tonight. And I'll start in verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my beloved Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Greet, salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them, which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus. 
which are in the Lord. Salute Tryphena and Tryphosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Pers Persis, which labored much in the Lord. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Salute es es Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are uh, with them. Salute Philogolus and Julia, Nerus, Nereus, and his sister and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Let's pray. Father, bless your word tonight. Bless, uh, Father, speak to hearts, meet with needs, Lord God. And Father, thank you, thank you. Thank you for freedom and liberty in Canada. Thank you for the health and strength that you've given each and every one of us. Thank you for life. Thank you for eternal life. Now, Father, we pray that those who do not have you as personal Savior tonight, that they would open their eyes and their heart to you, Lord God. Help them not allow the God of this world to blind their hearts, Lord God. Help them tonight. And for believers, Lord God, help us to, again, remind ourselves of, God, all these special people, Lord God, that you've put in our lives, Lord God. God, you're a great God. Thank you for the fellowship of the saints, Lord God. Help us to appreciate that more, especially in the times that we're living in, Lord God. Now bless our time. May your will and uh, way be done. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord again. Um, thank you for joining us. And as we look at this passage of scripture here tonight, let me go into verse uh, five. Verse five, of course, the first part <clears throat> is uh, connected there uh, concerning verse three, Priscilla and Aquila, we've already talked about that. Let's look at the next part of that verse where salute my well-beloved Eponidas, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. And Eponidas, you know, he's one of the first, very first converts, amen? And, uh, you know, Eponidas, uh, Achaia, in Achaia, uh, where Corinth was, where Paul wrote the letter uh, to the Romans, he was dear to Paul, and the Bible says there, he was well-beloved, amen? Well-beloved. You know, I think about those verses in the Bible, and we'll see again in this passage. You know, remember what God the Father said when he saw Jesus Christ, amen? So I'm at the, when the baptism there, John was baptizing Christ and they heard a voice and that said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. At the Mount of Transfiguration, they heard that voice. It sounded like thunder, the, the Bible records. What did they hear? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You know what? I hope you're, I hope you are God's beloved son. I hope, number one, you're saved. I hope, I hope tonight, I hope tonight that you're living for God if you're saved, amen? And you know what? Thank God that people, God has people. He says, my well-beloved, they're people that you love, amen? You haven't seen some people in a while now. It's been over a month, you know? You miss them, amen? You love God's people. Let's not take each other for granted, as I mentioned last week. Amen. God's people ought to be precious to you. Amen. The unity, the coming together, talking together, fellowshipping together. Man, I'll tell you, you ought to rejoice and thank God for the saints of God. Paul says, this man was beloved. Amen. It's not a term that Paul just threw out at anybody. There was something special about him. Amen. And uh, so anyway, again, one of the first fruits one of the first fruits, amen? You know, the blessing of uh, salvation, the blessing of reaching others with the gospel, um, you know, sometimes you see something right away and sometimes it takes some time, as we've been talking about the laws of sowing and reaping, um, you know, especially in the morning over the principles to freedom. And uh, there is a reaping. Uh, sometimes it doesn't come right away. And sometimes you witness and you labor and you know, you don't see some fruit at first, but as time goes on, the Bible even talks about, you know, uh, we will reap if we faint not in Galatians 6, 9 and 10, amen. So don't quit, don't give up, amen. The fruit will come. We, and of course, we're not gonna get all the rewards down here, amen. 
Looking forward to rewards up there for the Lord. Verse six, greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Amen. We're told about this Mary here. She labored much for Paul. Amen. And, uh, and uh, you know, she worked hard. She toiled. You know, you know, people, God's people, this labor, this work of love. Amen. Serving, helping other people. Amen. You know, um, I'm sure that this labor was such that even to the point of exhaustion, amen, these people that are in this list, we're, we're just kind of reading in what we, do, what we see, what Paul mentions here, but there's so much more to these people than what we read here, but this is what God wants us to know about them, these characteristics of laboring, laboring in the word, laboring in the gospel, amen, and um, so, you know, I thank God you know what, it, uh, sometimes your labors uh, may not be noticed, you know, but I know this, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll give you the reference here, 1 Corinthians 15, right at the end of the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and in verse 58, the last verse, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Listen, what you do for Christ will last forever. You're not wasting your life. God says, it's not in vain. It's not in vain. Your labor's not in vain. Your prayers are not in vain. Sowing the seeds of the gospel, you're not doing that in vain. You're not wasting your life. You know, there's a lot of things you can engage in in this life that is a complete, utter waste. It won't count for anything when you get to heaven. But when you live for God and you serve Jesus Christ and you love people, you get the gospel out, God says, you know what? That's a labor of love. And it's not in vain. It's not in vain, amen? Go to verse seven, Romans chapter 16, verse seven. <clears throat> a salute, Adronicus and Junia, my kinsmen. These are apparently, of course, are Jews. We even like read in Romans chapter nine where Paul had such this burden for, for uh, the, the, the Jews himself and that he wished he were, he himself were a curse from Christ for his brethren uh, sake. And uh, so these kinsmen, uh, they were apparently Jews. Um, they were in prison. He says they were my kinsmen. They were my fellow prisoners. Fellow prisoners. What better person to be in jail with than Paul the Apostle, amen? Fellow prisoners. And you know, as I've already mentioned before, when you study Paul's life, he never said once he was a prisoner of Rome. He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Why is he called a prisoner of the Lord? Because he obeyed God and he, he reached people with the gospel and he never looked at and said, well, Rome. No, he willingly took on this task, obeyed the Lord to get the gospel out, to preach the word of God. And he says, I'm here because I obeyed God. I'm a prisoner of, of Rome. And in a sense, I'm a prisoner of the Lord because I obeyed God, amen. Amen, wow. So here, Adronicus and Junia, they're both, again, in prison for the sake of the gospel. Um, and he says, who are of note among the apostles. You know, they're very noteworthy. These people, they were known uh, for their sacrifice and their service for God, amen. Thank God for people like that, amen. And uh, so uh, these two believers, as we read in that passage, they're kinsmen. We saw that. They're fellow prisoners there. We also see uh, they were known among the apostles. And then, last of all, they were in Christ before me. And again, this concept of being in Christ um, is so important. Uh, you know, meaning the church, the church. The church is the body of Christ, the Bible teaches us. We're not gonna get into that whole study tonight. But the moment you get saved, the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, amen? And uh, so the Bible says the moment you get saved, you're in Christ. But I believe in, there's many different terms that are used, of course, for salvation. The Lord even likens coming into Christ, being baptized or put into Christ, amen? You're in that body. Um, you know, there's, there, the, the word church is used in two, two sense 
uh, two ways throughout the scriptures in the New Testament. One is a physical, actual a body of people meeting together of locality. There's different places throughout the New Testament, and especially in Paul's letters. And then the other sense the church, word church is used in the sense of all believers, all those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior, who have put their faith and trust in him. And that's so important. So when people kind of mix up the two, uh, they feel that some groups say, well, no, there's just the local church in the Bible, nothing else. Well, my first question is this, how did you get in Christ? How did you get in, which is called the body of Christ, which is called the church? The only way you can get in is through salvation, amen? When you get saved, you're in the family of God and you're in Christ, you're in Christ and he's in us, amen? So uh, they were the first also in Christ before him. So they got saved before Paul did. And uh, so Paul mentions that fact there, amen? So what a blessing, what a blessing. Look at verse eight, <coughs> verse eight. Great Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Again, another believer, another person, amen, who is beloved in the Lord. Paul loved him, amen. Paul cared for him. You know, the brothers and sisters in Christ, do we truly love? Do we truly love one another? As a matter of fact, in John's gospel, the Bible says the way this world will know that we are God's people is by our love for each other. Not just our love for this world, like for God's love of the world, we reach out and get the gospel, but our love to and for each other. One of the worst testimonies that we could ever have as believers is, is when the lost of this world see the people of God fighting amongst themselves. That is a terrible, terrible testimony, amen? That will, causes more damage to the cause of Christ than anything else. How will they know that we're disciples of Christ? By our love to each other, amen? Do you love the brethren? Do you love the brethren? Look at verse nine, salute Urbane, our helper in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved, helper. He's a fellow worker, amen? They work together, work together. The Bible tells us, go to 1 Corinthians chapter three, 1 Corinthians chapter three, working together. You know what? God did not save you to just come to church and sit in a pew. God did not save you just for that. Listen. Folks come in the church sitting in a pew, being ministered to by the pastor, the preacher, the evangelist, the missionary, praise God, that's good. Ministering the word of God. But your service, you are receiving, you're receiving truth. And yes, prayerfully, hopefully, you're worshiping God in the prayer, in the song service, and worshiping God in your heart when you're here, amen. But church is so much more than that. There's so much more than that, amen. And, you know, a helper, being a helper, working, fellow workers, and God's people need to work together. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, in verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. For ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's billing. So Paul, when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians, there was a problem going on. There was a popularity contest. Some were saying, um, you know, in verse four, I am of Paul, and another say, I am of Apollos, and are you not carnal? You know, people saying, oh, my favorite preacher is this one, and my favorite preacher is this one, and listen, God bless you, you have a favorite preacher. Amen, that's fine. You know, Pastor Parrott, like I like what Jack Hiles used to say. He, he used to say that, um, he says, listen, I don't have to be number one on your prayer list, but can you at least put me on your prayer list somewhere? Amen. Can you just pray for me? Amen. Praise the Lord. I pray for you. Can you pray for me? Amen. So, but the thing is this, that's divisive. Having your favorites and, and causing division in the church through this. Well, I follow this preacher and he preached this and this one preached that. And, you know, this one on YouTube teaches this and this one on YouTube teaches that. Listen, can we sit down and open the Bible together? Now, of course, we can't get together like we'd like to, but can you think about the fact that, listen, you know, all this internet stuff, even what I'm doing now, it's a one-way 
conversation. Unless you're engaged on the chat on the right, amen, it's pretty much a one-way uh, you know, communication where you're receiving from the preacher, whoever it is, whether it be me or someone else on YouTube or Facebook or however medium you're, you're watching this, you're watching these messages by. And you can't interact with that preacher, generally speaking. So if there's a problem, and the other thing is this, you get to pick and choose what you wanna watch. When you come to church and sit in these pews here, which are empty right now, God, you know, I have three or four studies. Right now, we're just doing three. And when we're together, I'm doing four studies a week, Sunday morning, Sunday school, Sunday morning, 11, Sunday night at, at 6 p.m. and Wednesday night at seven. You're getting four meals a week. And the messages I'm preaching and the teaching that I'm doing, my goal and my prayer is to give you a balanced spiritual diet. You don't get to pick and choose. That's why you need to come to church. We can pick and choose any messages we like on here. I like this message. Oh, look at that one. But are you getting all that you need? You can turn off what you don't like. You can turn on what you like. But you need to come to church. Amen? You need to come to a place where we meet together. We see each other. We fellowship together. We're working together. We're ministering together. And when there is some questions on some teaching that maybe you've heard outside of church or maybe even from me as pastor within the church. We can interact and talk to each other, open the Bible up. And iron can sharpen iron, as the Bible says, amen, to help us learn, amen, together. So uh, we're on the same team. He says, hey, listen, urbans of hell, uh, uh, help our helper in Christ. He says, we're on the same team. We got the same goals. We got the same purposes, the same vision, the same dreams. We're working together. We're not fighting one another. Amen. That's what church is supposed to be like. You know, and again, you get sometimes in a church, sometimes people have their own little agenda. And, and listen, if you're in a church and we're not talking about a serious doctrinal issue, but it's just a matter of preference that you want something done a certain way. And the majority of the body has decided to do it a certain way. You need to you know, after it's voted on, decided, however you do it, you need to get behind the body and let go of this difference that you had and move on for God. Amen. Now, if it's a serious doctrinal issue, you need to confront the pastor. You need to confront the individual that you're dealing with and talk to them face to face alone. Don't talk to anybody else. That's what the Bible, that's what Jesus taught in Matthew 18, one on one. Then if you can't resolve it, bring a, a witness, two or three witnesses if not, then you bring it before the church. The church is always the last place, last place. I've dealt with most of the problems one-on-one, -on -one, face to face. It is rare, it is rare in all the years of ministry that I've ever seen or had to deal with, whether as an assistant helping out a church out in Niagara Falls for 17 years, or whether a pastor in here for 25 plus years, where we've had to have bring it before the church. You can deal with stuff, but you gotta work together, amen? We need to work together as God's people. And stack us, my beloved. Amen. Here's another one. Paul says, I love these people. Boy, I thank God. Amen. I thank God. Listen, we ought to love one another. Love, 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 love one another. Amen. Verse 10. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. So he talks about approved, approved. Amen. Approved. You know, the Bible talks about being approved unto God. It's not approval of man necessarily. It's approval of God, approval of the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If we don't study the word of God, we'll be ashamed because we'll say some things that are unscriptural and we can be corrected by that, amen? A book, a book, God's word, approved, approved, amen? Approved. Also, in the sense of approval here, he's approved in Jesus Christ. What does that also mean? Not only that, you know, uh, what he's, how his life is and so forth, but it also means this, in the sense of testing. He's probably been through some trials and tests, amen? And, uh, you know, the testing of life, the testing, the fires of life have a way of showing, revealing to others the real us, amen? Who are we? It's easy to, to serve God, live for God when things are going what we would call smoothly. 
things are kind of going our way and everything's happening the way we'd like it. But when things start to change, we begin to see the real us, the real inside of us, amen? And we need God's help and strength. So I believe this man is not only, you know, approved in the sense of he showed himself approved unto God, but I believe he's also gone through some testing, amen? He's gone through some testing. And um, he's been through some trials and afflictions and circumstances in life. And Paul says, boy, he's a good guy. You know, if I'm gonna put my stamp of approval on somebody, it'd be this guy, Apelles. He's a good man, amen? He's been through it. He suffered, boy, I tell you, he's a good man. You can count on him. He's a faithful man, amen? Praise God, praise the Lord, amen? And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And then he says, salute them, which are of Aristobulus' household, okay? Aristobulus. He says, salute them. So many different people, so many different people, amen? Now, some have said here, suggested that this guy may have been the grandson of Herod the Great, the brother of Herod Agrippa I, could have been, amen? It's also, it's hard to determine. Um, but anyway, so, but it's interesting. If he was, sometimes you think about that, you think people are getting saved. People, God used Paul to reach and to help and so forth. In some places, in places, can you imagine? Uh, in one of the most ungodly families in the history of mankind. You know what? It's, thank God, thank God tonight. As I mentioned a week or two, a couple of weeks ago, you know, you look out, you know, as a pastor, I look out at the congregation, I see the people that are out there and, and you look at them and you think, you know what? If we were all unsafe, we probably could not meet together in the harmony that we have. We'd probably be at each other, you know? And, uh, but God does a great work, amen? God does that work, amen? And uh, so God does a wonderful work of grace in, in people's lives, and thank God, amen? And uh, so uh, look at verse 11, salute, salute Herodian, my kinsman. Again, as we already referred kinsman, I believe, referring to the fact that he's a Jew, amen? the close kinship of brethren. You know, and again, Paul's prayer was, and again, I probably should have read that to you. Just keep your place in Romans 16, <coughs> in Romans chapter nine. The, uh, the Bible says here in Romans chapter nine, actually I'll say it in Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Amen, so we had a prayer for them. Go to chapter nine. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing witness uh, in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I wish my, that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. He says, you know what? If it was possible to trade my salvation so that others would be saved that are Jews, I would do it. But it's not, of course. He couldn't be a curse from Christ. Amen. Once when you're in Christ, you can't be accursed from Christ. Amen. Man, I'll tell you, wow. You know, you read back there in Exodus 32 and remember Moses, um, God wants to wipe them all out on there on that, after that mount situation, the golden calf. And Moses says, blot me out of your book, Lord, but spare these people. Wow. Could you say that? Could you say that? That's love. That's like you'd be willing to give up your, your salvation, your name in God's book. Wow, 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 amazing, amazing. Um, so anyway, but uh, Herodian, Herodian, my kinsman, amen? Then he says, Narcissus. And again, it's interesting you study some of the mythology back in that time, place of the world there, Narcissus. Um, you know, there was, it was like a mythological youth there. Um, you know, it was so beautiful that supposedly all the girls, you know, longed to be his, but he shunned them and he, and, and he wouldn't have none of them. Finally, one of the girls uh, whose heart he wounded prayed this prayer to the gods, you know, his mythology. May who loves, may he who loves not others love himself. And the god Nemesis granted that request and Narcissus bent over a clear pool for a drink and saw there his own reflection. He immediately fell in love with it. He burned with love for himself and could not stop gazing at that reflection. 
He stayed there putting away, pining away until he died. Thus, narcissus, where we get narcissism, has become the term which refers to self-love, an excessive infatuation with self. You know, we, you know what? We live in that day. In 2 Timothy 2, 3, it says that men would be lovers of their own selves. They'd be lovers of themselves. We have self-love. That is so unbiblical. When we hear, I hear Christians talk about self-love, I'm thinking, I don't know what Bible you're reading. You're not reading the Bible. You got something that's not according to the scriptures. There's nowhere in the Bible that says love yourself. You're supposed to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you're supposed to love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Amen? Those are the two primary areas we need to focus our love in. But the Bible says in the last days, people, men would be lovers of, of their own selves. And that's what we're seeing today, amen? A lot of self-love. And uh, so anyway, uh, great them of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Amazing all these people, amen, that have come to know Jesus Christ. Salute um, Tryphena and Tryphosa who labor in the Lord. And again, some other be believers who labor. Amen. And again, when this is mentioned, it's just not people who are working for the Lord, but beyond that. Paul, you know, there's many people Paul knew, but these people were exemplary in this area of laboring, you know, again, to the point of weariness, exhaustion, you know, um, you know, they, they, labored, they labored, they labored. Amen. Um, Tryphena, Tryphosa, who labored in the Lord. Amen. And uh, so um, then also he says there, and salute also, salute the beloved Persis, 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 amen? And uh, who labor, amen? Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. You know what? Again, people laboring for God, serving the Lord. You know, we got all these witnesses. I like that in Romans in Hebrews chapter 12, keep your place there. Hebrews chapter 12. You know, we can't, these people that are Christians that written in Paul's letter in chapter 16, people that were a blessing to him and a help to him in the ministry, you know, uh, these people, they're, they're in heaven. They're in heaven. And, you know, Hebrews chapter 12 is just an interesting passage the way the Lord uh, the words are in this passage. Wherefore, verse one of Hebrews 12, Seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down to the right hand of the throne of God. Can we think about these people in this list that we're going to see someday? How do we compare? And I know our standard is not these people, but these are. God, these are recorded people, uh, inspired scriptures that God has given us. We read in Hebrews 11, the preceding chapter to where we just read in Hebrews 12, 1, a list of faithful people. By faith, through faith, by faith, through faith. They did things, they did things. Amen, there's all these verbs. You read every, all these verses, they, they did this, they did this, they did this, they did this. Go, go through that chapter, read it. Read it and you'll see. Faith is... Is, is an action word. You put your faith and trust, now let's show it. Amen, that's what James talks about. You say you have faith, let me see your works. Amen, you do something with it. You do something about it. That's what God wants. These people are doing that, amen. They're, they're great examples. Um, we see here, look at verse uh, 13. Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. You know what? Um, I'm telling you something here. God is so good to us. God is so good to us, amen? Go to John chapter 15, verse 16. Keep your place in Romans 16. John 15, John 15. John 15. John chapter 15. Let's look at verse 15. We'll start at verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, 
for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made and known unto you. Now watch this, verse 16. Chosen in the Lord. Let's, what, what's this chosen thing? Verse 16, for you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Notice, and conjunction, and ordained you. Why? What, 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 what did he call us to do? That ye should go and bring forth fruit. God says, I've chosen you for a task. Amen, you got a purpose. We all have a purpose here. Amen, God just didn't save you to take you to heaven. God saved you for a purpose. What are you doing with the gifts that God has given you since you've been saved? Are you using them for the Lord? He says here, he's chosen you, ordained you, that means called us to do what? Should go, bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. God wants us to be fruitful. Now, fruitfulness can be displayed in many different ways. We know of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. We also see it used in the sense of, of those who come to know the Lord through our efforts and witnessing, amen? And we're just one of many that probably had a part in that person's life to reach them, amen? But God wants us to be fruitful. When you read the beginning of the chapter, he talks about fruitfulness, the vine and the branches. Read the, the beginning of the chapter, and even says in John 15, in verse five, that without me, you can do nothing. Amen? It's because of the Lord God allows us. It's through him in us and through us that he uses us to reach people, to help people. And he says that you should go. We need to go out and tell people about the Lord, get the gospel out, bring forth fruit. Your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So the Bible says, I've chosen you. Chosen, amen, for a special task, special task, amen. And uh, he says, and he even attaches a prayer promise to it. So if you go, amen, if you go, you bring forth fruit, and your fruit remains. God says, here you go. You can claim this promise, amen. A lot of us claim promises we don't satisfy the conditions of the promise. And in this one, it has to do with telling people about the Lord, uh, and being fruitful and that fruit remains, amen? That's what God wants to do. He wants to use you. He wants to use you, amen? And then he says, Rufus, verse 13, chapter 16, Rufus, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. Wow, praise the Lord. You know what? What a great blessing, amen? Chosen in the Lord, his mother and mine. You know, what a blessing to have people uh, friends, family, brothers and sisters in Christ, what God has done. You know, I have, I have found as a believer uh, over the years, uh, uh, even before I was pastor, that God's people, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, my relationship with them was actually, has been, by practice, more closer uh, in that relationship than those of my own flesh and blood, you know? By the way, if you have flesh and blood family that's, that doesn't know Christ, you ought to be praying for them and trying to reach them with the gospel because on this side of heaven, they will not, they will never, you will never see them again on this side of heaven um, unless they know Christ, unless they come to know Christ, receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it's with the people of God that even when Jesus was confronted in the New Testament, they looked at Jesus and he says, your mother and your brethren are here, Jesus. And he looks over all the believers and says, here's my family. Amen. Jesus, in many examples in the Gospels, shows to us how that the spiritual relationship is a higher relationship than your flesh and blood relationship. Amen. Some Christians got to get that one straight. They don't understand that. They put flesh and blood relationship. You got father, mother, brother, and sister. Listen, we're not talking about mistreating anybody, but Jesus said, Jesus said that your relationship to me and to each other in Jesus Christ is higher than flesh and blood. Amen? So we got a family. Church ought to be like a family. When people come into a church, whether it be this church, New Testament Baptist Church of Halifax, or any other gospel, Bible-believing church, they ought to say, I feel like I'm at home. I feel like I'm around family. 
Amen. This is like a family. Amen. People love me. People are reaching out to me. People are caring for me. Amen. You got to thank God for that. You got a church family. Don't take it for granted. On vacation, on vacation. This is what you ought to be doing. On vacation. Amen. I believe you ought to go to Bible believing preaching churches, but it wouldn't hurt to check out some of these other places. And I hope and pray and set me aside as pastor. Set me aside when I make this statement. Amen. That you ought to, when you go, you, you ought to say this, I miss my home church. I miss my home church. That church is not like my home church. I thank God for my church, amen. I thank God for my pastor. I thank God for the people that I fellowship with, amen. I hope when you're on vacation, you go to church, and I hope you miss your home church, amen. Amen. That ought to cause you to appreciate everyone more. When we get back from all of this distancing and all these restrictions, you ought to have more love and care for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow. What a, what a great God. And again, here's another list. Wow. So many, so many. Salute, Asyncritus, Phlegon, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. All these names, amen? Can you imagine? Paul's finds something wonderful say, to say about each and every. You know, he says, you know, their labor, their beloved, all these different things that we've read, amen? He cares, he cares, he's reaching out, amen? Um, you know, this is, this is his thank you list. This is like his thank you card. This is like, you know, these people are a blessing to me. I thank God for them. He mentions them by name, amen? Thank the Lord, thank the Lord. And look at this. So ver look, just between four, uh, verses 14 and 15, salute Philagalus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Wow, you know, there's 10 believers, 10 believers, amen, in verses 14 and 15. Wow, you know, they're greeted by name there, as you can see. And then, of course, some are greeted as relatives, amen? And then he says, and all the saints which are with them. And again, speaking of the church in Rome, amen? Wow, what a, what a greeting. And you know, Paul hasn't even, Paul hasn't even been to Rome. And he's talking about these Christians, these people. You know, I haven't traveled a lot in my day. I've been here and there, mostly, of course, Canada and the U.S. Since I've been saved, you know, we visited different. We have visited different churches, and it's just great to get around to, to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And you know, you think about them, you think about the people, and uh, you know, you enjoy your fellowship with the saints. Amen. And again, just don't think take anything for for granted. Amen. And uh, so, you know, all these different people, they're laboring, laboring. Amen. They're laboring in the Lord, serving God. They're beloved of Paul. Um, man, they're special people. They're special people, amen. And then he says in verse 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, of course, in our modern society tonight, you know, at least in, in um, our church circles, maybe this would not be the standard greeting, but obviously back then it was, Um but at the same time, here, of course, we would shake hands and some would hug and so forth, amen. We greet each other that way. We greet each other with, hey, hi, how are you? Good day, amen. Good to see you, praise the Lord, amen. Uh, but there was a kinship amongst God's people, amen. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, amen. God can't, you cannot deny that. You cannot deny that at all, amen. Greeting one another, salute one another, amen? Um, you know, and we salute, we greet one another, uh, you know, you know, in church, I, I've seen this over the years where sometimes some people have had some issues with somebody else and then they kind of ignore or walk away and that should be taken care of, amen? That should be looked after. That should be dealt with, amen? And uh, God's people need to resolve that, reconcile Go right up to them and let's talk. Let's talk this over, amen. You shouldn't stay. I mean, the Bible says you shouldn't even let your wrath go down. 
uh, you know, the sun, when that sun sets, man, you no, don't even let a day go by. Deal with it, take care of it, amen? And he says, the churches of Christ salute you. He says, the churches of Christ, they sent their greetings to the church that was in Rome, amen? The churches of Christ, the first century, they had a kinship and unity, amen? In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, he talks about this teaching in every church. So they had the same teaching, amen? Paul trained men for the ministry, amen? People were set up as pastor, bishop, elder in the church and deacons, amen? They had the same practice, amen? And um, in 1 Corinthians 7, 17, they had the same custom, amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16. They had the same order. You know, God says, I love, I quote this verse a lot, that God's not the author of confusion. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. In each of these verses, there's so much more we can say about where their context is, what, where they're located in these books and these chapters and these verses, but I, 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 we don't have time. So there's these churches, amen? Thank God, thank God, thank God. You know what? I, I think it's good. I think it's important for God's people to um, turn around and, uh, like I said, you know, hey, you're on vacation, visit, um, visit other churches, you know, go hear some preaching and teaching. The Bible says it's important. It's important. I want to turn, have you turn to a passage of scripture. We got to wind down here. Uh, we're running out of time, but look at uh, look at uh, chapter thirteen, Second Corinthians chapter thirteen, and we're going to wrap this up. And Lord willing. Next week, we'll, we will finish up the chapter, amen, next Sunday night. Again, there's so much more we can go in depth and so forth, but uh, let me just read this passage here. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now, in context, you know, if you study this, he says this is the third time, and he talks about if you mention there's, a, there's another epistle that we don't have, and we can't focus on what we don't have, we gotta focus on what we do. So basically what you have here at First and Second Corinthians are two of three epistles, okay? And uh, so only two epistles were included in the canon of scripture. And if, go, if you go to First Corinthians 5, 9, I don't have time, but it mentions another epistle. So anyway, but he says in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So there's a very important principle here. So as pastor, I, I try as much as possible to engage in going out to different conferences and different meetings. Um, and it, it's, it's important. It's important because sometimes if people just within the church, some say, I, you know, I love my pastor. Thank God for my pastor. Amen. Praise the Lord. Love him. Amen. And uh, you get, but you can sometimes get used to hearing that same voice. And sometimes we get dull of hearing. Sometimes we, we're not receiving what we ought to receive because we get so used to that voice. You know, that's why as much as possible, I encourage people, you know, engage in these different meetings of Bible-believing preaching and teaching, amen? And also, we try as, you know, as a church, of course we can't, to have different preachers in. Um, over the years, we've had many different preachers we haven't had anybody as of late, but, you know, and it's important that you hear the same message maybe, but maybe presented in a different way, the same truths. And, you know, when I was a young pastor, uh, there's some things I have to learn. One of those things is very important. The Bible even teaches that in 1 Timothy 3, that we need to be careful of pride. That's the condemnation of the devil is church leaders. Amen. Get so lifted up. And, you know, in those early years, when I was ministering, we'd have a guest preacher in, and that guest preacher would preach a message. It was a great message. But some of the material he covered, some of the principles he covered were principles that I had taught, that I had preached. And at the end of the service, the altar was flooded with people. And at first, I was like a little bit of pride. And I preached that. Why didn't they? Why didn't they act upon? I preached that before. I preached that last year, last month, whatever. And then I came to grips with something in my life as pastor, and I've tried to hold to this to this very day. When God works in somebody's heart through another preacher, 
or another teacher, I ought to rejoice. Because really when you get down to it, the, your, the people, these people are not my people. I don't own people. They're God's people. Amen? I'm a child of God. You're a child of God if you're saved. And if God uses another person and another preacher to speak to someone else's heart and it helps them draw closer to God, we all win. It's not an issue of who taught that, you know, or when did that person respond or under my preaching, under my ministry? No, that doesn't matter. What really matters is, are you going to get it right with God? Are you going to take care of whatever it is you're dealing with? As I preached this morning, um, again, another principle, principles to freedom. You know what? If there's some place somewhere else that has taught some principles that has spoken to your heart, praise God. Amen. As long as it's Bible-based, praise God. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that that touched your heart. Amen. And so Paul says, you know what? You need a second or third witness. You need that. Hear the same message maybe from a different voice, maybe using different passages. We all have different mannerisms, amen? We're all different personalities, us as preachers and teachers and missionaries and evangelists. But praise God. Is God gonna work in your heart? Are you gonna receive the message? That's really the bottom line. Are you gonna do something about what you heard, amen? Well, listen, we need to stop there tonight. Thank you again for joining us. And uh, let me just pray tonight. Um, and uh, of course, you know, we need to keep folks in prayer um, in our church, you know, and we'll mention some of that, of course, in a few moments here in our Zoom meeting following um, this message here. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for our time together. Pray, Father, you would help us to appreciate one another. Thank you for these people that, God, you recorded in your word. Help us, Lord God, to think about people. Help us take a time to make a phone call, write a card, send a note, connect through social networking some way, Lord God, to your people, Lord God. Thank you. Thank you for your word. And God, we pray for those who don't know you, that you would touch their hearts, help them to come and know your son, Jesus Christ, as Savior. Thank you again for your goodness. Thank you for your love to us. Help us to appreciate one another, Lord. And God will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, please, uh, if you haven't, subscribe to the channel. And uh, when you do subscribe, you'll get notifications and also um, set the reminder to remind you when these messages come up online and when they'll be aired, okay? And also, if you've got any questions about any of the things that I've preached about, taught about, please send me an email, send me a message. Some of you within the church, the regular attenders and members, we have email, text messages, phone call, of course, got a question. Um, love to help you. Uh, also, those who don't know Christ as Savior, yep, you, don't, you haven't put your faith and trust in Christ, please take a few moments and uh, go to our webpage at ntbchalifax.ca. The link is down below in the description. And just go there and check out our webpage. There's a place called Salvation. Go into that, look at that, think about that. Ask God to speak to your heart and uh, love to help you come to know Christ. Amen, whatever we can do to help you, amen. And uh, so God, may, may God bless you tonight. And, uh, you know, until we meet again, you know, I trust you'll serve God and take to heart what you've heard tonight, amen.